Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Robert Dean Clayton, and I'm the CEO and founder of the Sports Analytics Club program that is a sponsor uh, of this opportunity for you to learn more about data and its application to the sports industry. Um, the Sports Analytics Club program is a nonprofit founded in 2017 uh, by Professor Ben Shields at MIT Sloan and a good friend of mine, Ed Tapscott, who was then the vice president of the NBA Washington Wizards. And the thought was, how do we increase the interest among young women, who are now 15% of this field of data science, African Americans, who are 3%, and Hispanics, who are 7%, so that they get interested not only in terms of becoming data scientists, but learning the fundamental skill sets when they're in high school of data science education. How do they get interested in pursuing an advanced degree? And I understand you may be interested in introducing a major in data science, and how do they then pursue an opportunity in the field? And we, we came to the realization that we need to design sports-driven research projects where they learn how to research. They learn how to build customized dashboards. They learn what scraping is. They learn what structuring is. They learn what cleansing is. They learn what algorithms are in creating data visualizations. And that's what 34 clubs in 14 states across the country and the district have done since 2017 to the current. What's great about this opportunity is that we created a feeder system in 2017. It caught an ESPN documentary. We built it to the point that as you introduce a major coming up, as you have a minor now, I've built an inner structure of young people who will be looking to come to a school of data science, be looking to major in data science. And so the beauty of this is the collaboration between schools of data science, institutes, departments, curricula, and course teachers, industry, because we have the data scientists from the professional sports teams, we have 37 university partners, and we have 34 secondary teachers that teach the fundamental skill set. So welcome to this occasion. I hope there are a lot of our younger people who are graduates of our school systems um, across the country to be in this audience five years from now where they can sit and say, I was introduced to this as a ninth grader. I learned how to do Python. I learned how to do R. I know what structuring is. I know what cleansing is. And I'm we're here to be advanced in the education as opposed to learning the fundamental skill set. So thank you for being here. And I look forward to having our students here in the future. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Steve Beck. I'm an associate professor of data science here at the UVA. Uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about geometric data and analysis, which is my research topic uh, in application uh, to sports. So uh, geometric data analysis literally is about analyzing geometric data using statistical models and machine learning tools. Um, especially when it comes to sports, um, there are a lot of uh, geometric data out there um, before I get started, uh, I must disclose that I have the, uh, some financial conflicts of interest with the following entity, so uh, my talk may uh, include some contents influenced by uh, those financial relationships. Um, now, um, computer vision uh, is one of, the, one of the tools that we access geometric data, and then uh, is probably uh, one of the you know, rapidly emerging tools in sports science as a way of collecting data of athletes and, you know, all the other stuff. So uh, what I'm about to show you is a video from NFL about a project to uh, basically convert all the NFL stadiums into a gigantic motion capture lab so that they have a better understanding of what's happening on the field. What if this isn't just a stadium? What if it's actually a data source that could shape the future of football to help keep players healthy, safer, and reduce injuries? The NFL with Amazon Web Services is using artificial intelligence to create the digital athlete, an injury prevention and prediction tool, running any play from any angle in any condition. We're talking infinite simulations because striving to make the game safer is no longer a what if, but what's next. So the future that they're envisioning is um, imagine stadiums, you know, equipped with all the sensors and cameras, and then all these cameras are, you know, looking at the players during the game and practice. Uh, these are not some, you know, simulated data created in the lab environment. These are real data coming from the field during the game during practice, right? Um, and what uh, they're envisioning is basically to collect all the motion data of the players 
uh, what kind of events has happened in the, on the field during the game, you know, during the practice, or you know, what was the, the trajectory or the historical movement of you know, each individual players. All kind of coming to you know, a data-driven way of you know, understanding and analyzing people's movement, uh, especially, you know, people are uh, very interested in the prediction of injury, like what are the contributors to the, uh, you know, formation of injury. Uh, so that kind of knowledge could be extracted from motion data. So uh, the key enabler of this technology is what is called a markerless motion capture, or nowadays more popularly known as human pose estimation. So human pose estimation is, in fact, not the uh, terribly new technology, um, so to speak. Uh, it's been around, actually, from 1980s. Um, and, um, you know, it's been around for quite a while. Uh, this, for example, is a, a work that I've done about a decade ago. Um, about the use of computer vision to understand golf swing motion and then provide individualized feedback. But back then, the problem was computer vision systems were not smart enough to uh, be uh, resilient to different imaging conditions, different illumination conditions, and so on and so forth. So they're pretty sensitive. And now when you talk about sports analytics, we're talking about on-field data. There, there are all sorts of things can happen. You know, games can you know, take place during the night, during the day, right? There can be rain, snow, like all kind of things can happen. And from the person like me who does computer vision, it's a nightmare, right? But nowadays, um, you know, there's been a dramatic change and improvement in the human pose estimation technology enabled by this thing called convolutional neural networks, or more broadly speaking, deep neural networks. So uh, computer systems are nowadays way much smarter in terms of their cognitive ability to understand, you know, in this gigantic, you know, video, a collection of pixels, where are all the major body joints are located, and, and so on and so forth, so that this is kind of the, um, sort of, the recent, um, you know, technology where uh, the pose estimation algorithm is applied to a video data, nothing special, it's a TV broadcast, and then you can apply the algorithm, and then obviously the, the players does not wear any special markers or sensors, but still you can get a pretty good um, you know, uh, detection accuracy. This is actually five years ago, so this is sort of new technology. Uh, fast forward to 2022, this is the quality of data you can get, which is pretty amazing. So as you can see, uh, you can track all the 3D motion, you can reconstruct what's happening on the field in, three, in full 3D, and then you can extract so much data from those um, markerless motion capture technology. Because again, you don't have to wear a special suit or sensors or anything. You don't have to spend hours to place markers on the body. You just point a camera and you're ready to go. So, like I said, you know, this kind of technology makes data collection, human motion data collection, so much more affordable, scalable, and accessible. So, from those kind of, you know, computer vision-based uh, post-tracking data, what you're able to do now is to understand and analyze the, you know, uh, individual, the joint angles, joint velocities, and things like that, all of which can you know, be a great feature uh, and can be used as an indicator if the person is, uh, for example, overusing certain joints or, you know, is there any fatigue being accumulated or was there any abrupt, you know, change of joint angles and so on and so forth, all of which can indicate, you know, the future possibilities of developing overuse injuries, uh, musculoskeletal injuries, and so on and so forth. So in combination of all the other data stream, nowadays the human motion data is becoming a crucial part of what is called the athlete management system, or AMS. So the teams and leagues are collecting a lot of data, and then the computer vision-based motion capture data is rapidly becoming part of that. Um, and then they're all but kind of being collected per each individual player. So it's not like a, the entire league or entire you know, team as a lump sum. It's more like an individually tailored data set from which data scientists can develop more precise, individualized, tailored prediction models for injury and performance. So here's a little bit of what we do here at the School of Data Science. Uh, this is um, uh, one of our, some of our team members. 
uh, working on the digital human model research. Uh, several things that we do, uh, one of the things is you know, uh, kind of a 3D motion capture, not at just the individual body joint level, but also at the surface level, because some sports, contact is an important, you know, uh, cause of injury, obviously. And then in order to analyze, you know, contacts, you need to have a surface model. You cannot just compare stick figures and calculate the, you know, interchange of forces and things like that. So in order to be able to do that, we're developing some mathematical tools to uh, register 3D surface models on an on-field uh, video data so that we have an accurate 3D reconstruction of not only the jo uh, body joint angles, but also the, the entire surface of the body. We're also working on this uh, concept called a motion manifold. Uh, simply speaking, this is kind of a mathematical space of how you know, the human motions are defined. So like when I make a posture, you, can, you see my posture. And one way of describing my body posture is by using you know, body joint angles. So my elbow is 72 degrees, uh, my shoulder is uh, 94 degrees, and so on and so forth. That's one way of describing um, you know, body joint angles and postures, but there are actually many more advanced mathematical ways of describing uh, uh, body posture and the movement. And then the nice thing about this is it gives us a unique data space or analytical space where we can understand and model uh, various different motions. So here, uh, Here's a, a one example uh, in collaboration with the pediatrics department where we're using this motion manifold theory uh, to understand the movement of infants. Uh, an interesting thing is the infants with the neurological conditions, they tend to exhibit some uh, cramped and synchronized movement. So normal babies tend to have a very random uh, generalized movement, whereas uh, kids with a neurological condition, they tend to have a very restricted movement. And then what we're doing is we develop a mathematical space of representing those movements so that we can uh, understand better uh, what's really happening. So the idea is nurses you know, or healthcare providers can you know, point a smartphone, they record a video of the babies, and then the machine learning algorithm behind it uh, basically analyze you know, how cramped and synchronized those movements are, and then you know produce a score in terms of uh, the, as an indicator of the neurological condition. A similar kind of technology is being used in the sports science as well. So uh, one of my students, Jason Wang, is a, a huge tennis enthusiast, and he's uh, using uh, all this computer vision and uh, motion manifold theory to understand and analyze tennis swing motions. And one of the really cool things is he's creating a database of professional tennis players from videos downloaded from YouTube. So it's not like inviting all this you know, busy, expensive tennis players into motion capture room and then create a database. It's rather collecting all the videos of Federer, Nadal, you know, Djokovic, and you know, a lot of other players. And then from those visual cues appearing in the YouTube videos, we can create a, uh, a motion space so that we have a mathematical you know, baseline to understand and analyze human motions. Finally, uh, this is one of the uh, you know, research facility that's, um, uh, that, that we have. It's comprised of 100 DSRR cameras. And what we do is to collect videos of people engaging in a lot of different motions so that we can create all this high quality, high resolution 3D surface scans of people in movement. And this kind of serve as a great data source for teaching AI algorithms and computer vision algorithms to understand uh, human movement better. So with that, thank you very much. And um, uh, if you have any questions, uh, maybe after this talk, uh, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's still morning. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie Kupperman. I am an assistant assistant professor here at the School of Data Science. Today I'm going to talk about how we can think about sports science in the realm of the 4 plus 1 model that we use here at the School of Data Science. Uh, similar to Steve, a lot of my work is in uh, injury and human motion analysis. My PhD is in kinesiology. So while many of you are interested in sports analytics, I talk a little bit more about sports science, um, which is just 
one piece of the broad spectrum of sports. Um, but whenever I say sports science, and this is what I'm going to talk about, is easily applied to sports analytics and how we can reframe sports analytics also. So for those of you who know the 4 plus 1 model, this will be a refresher for those of you who don't. The 4 plus 1 model was developed by a professor here at uh, Data Science, uh, Professor Alvarado. It takes four different areas of data science and puts them around a domain space. So we have value, design, analytics, which is probably the most obvious one for people, and then systems. Uh, and then they all come to the plus one, which is practice or a domain expertise. Uh, and while these have clear cut uh, divisions between each of these areas, really these intersections are fuzzy. That value and design bleed into one another. Analytics and systems bleed into one another. They are not clearly defined areas and this model only works if we also work at those intersections, which I will continually talk about in this presentation. In this same paper, Professor Alvarado also defined that arrow looks really funny, I'm sorry, it's supposed to be a little bigger. Uh, this U-shaped um, pipeline for data science. We often think of pipelines as a linear kind of trajectory. In data science, we like to have this U-shaped pipeline. Uh, data science is, is prides itself on being very domain specific uh, and having very apl um, applied um, practices from the data that we collect and analyze. So we take in data from a domain, in this case, sports science, we're taking in data from cameras, like the camera Steve just talked about. Uh, we talk about um, data from sensors, performance metrics, on-court stats. Those go through our pipeline of values, system, design, analytics, and they come right back out to that same domain. It might be a little different, we're not, sometimes we're feeding that data back to a sensor, uh, but most part times we're feeding that data back to stakeholders, which might be athletes, coaches, uh, whole teams in themselves, or companies that are uh, tangentially related to a team. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about analytics. I'm going to go through all four of these domains. I'm going to spend most of my time in design. That's where I think um, we can make a lot of advances in data, data analytics, sports analytics, and sports science in the near future. Uh, when we think analytics in sports science or sports analytics, we often think of those money type, um, money ball type analyses. This, that book and then the subsequent movie uh, got a lot of people excited about these trends we can find in sports um, and created a lot of traction in the field. That's only one type of analysis that we can do in sports. Um, other types of analytics would be modeling and machine learning. If we move on to systems, when I think of systems in sports science, I think a lot about the tech that we use, the cameras that people develop, the sensors that are being developed, um, the force plates we use, uh, and also somewhat the management systems that we deploy in teams. A lot of times our management systems not only house our data, but they also help us collect data. Um, so I think of those as kind of the systems in which we put in our data. Uh, then we can, systems is also, related to our databasing and how we put all of our data together. This can be um, how we set up cloud computing, how we set up uh, databases, and how we develop those databases. Uh, the pictures you see here, uh, the basketball athlete, that's uh, Kyle Guy. If you're, if you're a Who fan, you know who he is. Uh, that's him at the Final Four game in 2019. He's wearing um, a harness, and in that harness lives this catapult sensor, which is getting whole body accelerometry. Um, and our, uh, a lot of our athletes here at UVA wear that sensor for all practices and games. Uh, next to that is a relational database, a schema for a relational database that I use to house a lot of our sports science data here at UVA. Uh, next is values. Um, a lot of you, if I would say, what are some ethical dilemmas that we need to consider when thinking about sports and data? Many of you would come up with these four bullet points all on your own. Uh, we talk a lot about data, data ownership. This is probably actually one of the more popular topics I'm asked to speak about recently, and it's always a question I get asked whenever I speak. Um, 
Data ownership is tricky. This one really depends on where in the world you live. If you're in the United States or if you're in the EU, it also depends on what level of sport you play. If you're at the professional level, you typically have a player association that's gonna broker how your data is collected and used. Um, so at the college level, there is no player association for athletes. Um, and so many of that lives at each institution and how data is collected, stored, and used on the athletes. Um, I feel like in the next few years, we're gonna have a lot more conversations at the college level about how we collect data on athletes, which I think is a good thing. We also have to talk about data security. Um, where is the data being stored and how securely is it being stored to make sure that the athlete monitoring systems that we're using um, you know, are meeting our standards of HIPAA and other data security measures that are put in by law, but also just ethically we need to have. Uh, and then also, who has access to the data? Does everyone have access? Does just our athletes, just our coaches? Do executives have access? These are all questions we need to ask. Again, we do have, in the United States, we have some laws that um, dictate this, but some of this is kind of the Wild West. Um, in the professional levels, again, this is brokered by the collective bargaining agreements. At the college level, this is still something that is institution by institution. And then also we have to talk about how are we using that data to make daily decisions, to make seasonal decisions on athletes. Um, we all can probably understand that data itself cannot make a decision for us, that we have to have some type of human interface to interpret that data and help to make decisions. Um, it probably shouldn't just be one person either, it should be a collective thought process. Uh, but we also need to really think and document how we make decisions based on data. I could have probably given a whole lecture on the value space. I'm very passionate about this in sports, too. Uh, but lastly, I want to talk most about design. Uh, when we think about design, we often think about visualizations. We think about ggplot, we think about matplotlib, we think about the fancy New York Times graphics and the interactive graphs. And that's all very true, that is, that is design, and that's a really fun part of design. Design is also this human computer interface. So how do we take that data from sensors that is not always very human readable, from, I promise you it's not, um, and how do we put that, make it in, meaningful to us, but also put that into some type of database, whether it's relational or non-relational, that can work well with the other data we're collecting, make that all work together, hopefully produce some meaningful outcomes, and then put that into a package that can go out and make sense for our stakeholders. Uh, most of the coaches I work with don't want a full report of data. They want like, like, give me one number that I understand. So how do we take all of this to find one number for the coach? Um, that to me is a large part of design. Also, how do we design our databases very thoughtfully? Not to take in the data that would be a little easier to database, like our, the survey measures that we might give athletes, but also how do we take in the camera data that we're getting, you know, second by second, sensor data that we're getting second by second, line all of that up to start to make bigger and better models that can give us more information about how sports really looks on the field and on the pitch, um, and not looking at things from just a practice level, but we can really now start to look at things you know, minute by minute in sport. But to do that, we have to really think hard about how we put that data together and how we can make it usable and accessible for the people who need to do that research. Uh, and then last, like I talked about, uh, visualizations, dashboards, and reporting are a big part of design um, and how we tell that story to coaches, uh, to people who read our research is important, and to the athlete themselves in a sense. Uh, that graph right there is actually player load. This is a little bit of a misnomer. I have volleyball pictures. The player load is actually from basketball players. Um, volleyball players get much more player load or workload during a practice than uh, basketball players do, they jump a lot more in volleyball. Um, that's over um, a full 
uh, uh, summer season and then the fall season. So we can kind of see the trends in a full team's workload along with lines that talk about how intense practice was and then just the basic duration of practice minutes. Coaches love minutes. They really understand minutes. So almost all of my graphs have minutes somewhere in there. Um, so then we talk about uh, the practical research. I've talked a lot about working with teams. That's very practical. They want minutes. When I talk to researchers, they want really complex models. So how does this all work together? So on the practical side, we need to have systems design in place so people can make in in the moment decisions using some data, using their own intuition. But we hope that, that those practical people, the coaches, the sports scientists embedded in the teams feed back that information to researchers so we can take a minute, we can slow down, look at that data in a really longitudinal sense and then feed it back to the practical side, hopefully with more robust ways to make decisions, uh, better ways to collect data. So these two really have to work together. We can't do the research without the teams collecting data. The teams are only going to get better if we find the best ways to work with their data. This is a great example of amazing design. This is the Good Stewards Applied Sports Science Lab here at UVA. It's the brainchild of Michael Curtis, who is the strength coach for the men's basketball team. I was very fortunate to do a lot of my dissertation work within this space. Um, and I, I, as a faculty member, I'm still doing a lot of research in this space. But we can see we have tons of sensors and cameras um, and built into this space and on the court with the catapult and the advanced stat system that you see at the bottom there. And so this space was designed that we collect that data. It feeds immediately into a system. Um, sometimes it takes us a while to process, this, process that data, but we can also get that data out immediately. So we almost have a feedback loop with that U-shape where occasionally we're feeding back into a system. So we, we take the data in, it goes through the pipeline very quickly, it comes out, and an athlete can get feedback on whatever they're doing in the, the training space, whether the weight room or the court, and make quick decisions or the coaches can help them make quick decisions. So why does framing sports science in the four plus one model matter? It matters for education. I think pedagogically, students love sports. And I think in each of these areas, we can have touchstones of sports that students are familiar with, whether or not they want to go into sports in the, for their career. Also, in how we collect data, ensuring that we collect data in ways that we can use that data. Um, and then the research and the resource allocation are tied together. Just looking through the pipeline to make sure that we're using our human resources and our monetary resources um, in the most efficient ways to make that entire pipeline and cycle work optimally. So thank you. I'm happy to answer questions after this talk for anyone who's interested. buttons, so I'll try to get it right on the buttons. There we go. Okay, my name is Bill Shear, and I'm going to talk about a little bit different, um, talk about some of the things I've been doing. All this work that I'm going to show you was done with undergraduate students and done by undergraduate students, and I'll talk about that. But my goal, my personal goal, has really been sports analytics as a way to motivate STEM, and, and working with Dean Clayton and the great work the Sports Analytics Club program does is really engage uh, people in STEM and see it as a way to motivate STEM and bring it about. Done all kinds of work with the football team, the softball team, field hockey, golf, lacrosse, and then field hockey, we used polar sensors where we had real-time biometric data and we did all kinds of uh, biometrics where we looked at loading and we came up with optimal training schedules for the field hockey. The polar sensors also give you uh, locations on the field, so we were able to use dynamic social networks to look at what optimal configurations would create a ball win in lacrosse. Football, we used all kinds of catapult data to again look at training loads on players. <clears throat> Golf, we have 280 fields of data at 60 hertz on every swing of the PGA for the last 10 years. It's pretty big data for that. And then lacrosse, we created a new ranking system for the NCAA for uh, ranking lacrosse teams, coming up with new metrics of how to rate teams. So all this kind of stuff we've been doing. I did put a background of my slide up here was for really one reason, and that reason was to embarrass my daughter who's here today. 
uh, who is in this picture. You can see if you can find her in the room today, but she's here. But the main, the main reason I put this up really was the idea that all these different things that I've done in my career, many years on the faculty, this is my 38th year on the faculty here at UVA. Last year I got a job with the House of Representatives and it was the first time I've had a title data scientist in my career. And so for me it was the first time someone actually called me a data scientist, so I'm trying to figure out what that means. But the interesting thing was, you look at that work, I built my first neural network in 1985 for the Air Force and I taught a course here in UVA on neural networks in the 80s. So some of this stuff has been around for a while. A lot of us have been using data to drive decisions for many years. So this is, a lot of this is really not that new. So what I want to, um, I have this as a busy slide, but I put the words, to me, the fundamental part of data science, to me, is the problem definition. And the words I put, I summarize it, the words down the right side is really, what are the goals? What are the metrics? Who are the stakeholders? What are the values of the decision makers? What are the trade-offs? What are the interactions? What are the key lift points? In my career, I've found the tools have been tertiary to almost every decision we've made. They've been really not the primary thing we've done. And of course, communication. I'll give you an example. So I want to talk about today is uh, not go to any of the, the uh, real-time data, but looking at some of the work I did for the UVA football team. This is work we did. We created a, a recruiting system for the UVA football team. We actually did a play calling system for the football team that was used until this year by the football team and has not been used in the current football season. And so the work we did with the football, though, we used over, we integrated over 50 different databases. This is, includes census data. We would take the home address of every high school athlete and we would get block code census data. We had pro football focus data. We had coaches by the number 24-7. We had mile stat data. We had, um, every, we had 250 fields of data about every uh, college program in America, how much the head coach makes, what their budget is, what their square footage is. So we had these 50 very different disparate databases, but none of it was big data. I would say it was more the data engineering and pulling these things together. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the goal was the hardest problem. Of all the work we did, five years of working with Bronco Mendenhall on this football recruiting system, the hardest part was really working on the problem definition. What were they really trying to ask? And I'll show you a couple quick examples here. But I'd say 90% of it was figuring out what the problem was. 5% was data wrangling, data engineering. 3% was modeling. The 2% was whatever else was left over. But most of it was not. So that disparate data really was not the issue. Let me give you a couple quick examples, though. Uh, one of my comments was don't believe in conventional wisdom. This is something we found. We also found this work we did with the NFL combine data that has no predictive value in the, in the professional football. We found out the composite score, the 24-7 composite score, which everyone uses, every school uses to say how good is a high school athlete, football player. You can see the graph there, the, the x-axis is the composite score by 24-7. The y-axis is the PFF grade. This is how they actually did play-by-play -play in their college career. And if you look at it, we can't get any of the players on the, on the right quadrant there. We can't get it, UVA. We've gotten one five-star recruit in the last 15 years. So if you look in the middle there, what do you see? What's the R squared? How predictive is the 24-7 composite score? The R squared is 0, 0.00 as the predictive value. There is no value to what they provide. You pay a lot of money for this. There's no value, we found. Conventional wisdom. So we reframe the question, working with the coaches, this is where the 90% with. Reframing the question, the question actually became, looking at the graph, we said, okay, Instead of saying, predicting how well players are going to do, high school players are going to do in college, we said, let's find the players that we can get. And that translated to models where we took, we created highly accurate PFF where we could forecast the college performance using all those 50 databases. We could forecast performance of a player in college. And so we would create our own forecast. And then we would map that against the composite score. And guess what? The green box were the ones that 24-7 says, hey, these players aren't, aren't, aren't that good. They're getting low star, but we predict to be good, and we call these the gems. We found dozens and dozens of players that no one else in the country is looking at that we could get by, this, by reframing the question is, we're looking for the gems. We're not looking for, we can't get the five stars. And by the way, if you look at the red box, we call those the duds. There were a lot of five stars that we predicted to be um, 
not so successful. And this is why the thing you read about a Tom Brady eighth round draft pick, you read about things like this is because the data has no predictive value that they use to pick these people. And we found that out. We built systems on this. Um, to find the right problem. Another question we says is they, the coaches said, what's the probability that a guy is going to come and join our team, that a player is going to join Virginia? So we came up with this model, ensemble model, ensemble of 10 different models. We built pretty sophisticated models on this, and we could come up with the probability. Turns out that wasn't what the coaches really wanted to know. So another three months of iteration with the coaches, what the coaches really wanted to know was, what is the competitive landscape? Who are the other teams that they're looking at? That's what I need to know when I'm recruiting a player because that's my competition. So you look at these are three UVA players. You look at Burton, for example. Okay, we're competing against Tennessee. Tommy Chris, we're competing against you know, Navy or we're competing against Michigan. So we can see this. So again, it, was, it took us a long time to get to the right question is what's the comp competitive landscape? The other one we did was, uh, you know, the, uh, another takeaway was always the missing variable. We built all these kind of models of, um, of where you're going to go, the previous slide. What's the probability you go to UVA or you go to Duke or you go to USC? We did that and we found out, you know, the things that you would expect. We found out, you can see them up there, the football revenue of the program is highly predictive. The number of NFL draftees, whether you're going to go join that team. The academic rank was an actually important. Um, the distance in miles. Why was the distance in miles important? because it turned out, and we use variations of this distance, but it turned out that could mom and dad, mom or dad drive and see them for the day and come to the games, and that became a huge variable. As a matter of fact, when we built these models, we built it out, the probability of a player west of the Mississippi went to zero. Bronco Mendenhall stopped recruiting west of the Mississippi. The, the model showed there's, there's the probability is too low, we can't compete with those. So you find out there's all these things. So the interesting variable that came in, it's on the bottom there, that we finally figured out after six months was that the January low, so the January low temperature between your hometown, where, you're, where you went to high school, and the college was one of the most predictive variables. And what it means is football players go south, they don't go north. So if you're, if you're a Virginia, if you're looking at a Virginia athlete, okay, Michigan's going to have a lot of trouble getting a Virginia athlete. Florida won't. Huge predictive variable of the, the delta and the temperature. But it's an example of that's always that missing variable you don't think about. It took us a lot of, a lot of effort to realize that mattered. We found the same thing in, in women's field hockey and predictive, and we were doing the health biometrics. We found out, you know, the game time humidity actually turned out to be a very significant factor in, in, in the biometric analysis we did. So there's always these kind of variables that come out. Um, for example, one of the things we found is the two sport. For the models, you're forecasting your PFF, your, how, we, how we think you're going to perform. Turned out two sports. If you play basketball in high school or track, it changes your, your odds of, of your score and quality in, in college football tremendously. But it took us a while again. So it's always these kind of missing variables. Last thing I'll talk about is how to measure grit. Last thing we did, Coach Menhall says, I want grit. We, how do you measure grit? Well, Angela Duckworth at the University of Pennsylvania has surveys we do. Well, we can't survey 25,000 high school athletes. We're not allowed. So what we ended up doing is we ended up reading all of their social media. Turns out 96% of high school kids have it public. We read all their social media. We ran it through IBM, their natural language processing. We scored it. We mapped those into the toughest players in the country and were able to get very highly accurate models by my measures. Highly accurate models that predicted how tough a player was. We um, predicted two players that would drop out. The first season we used this, both dropped out, as we predicted. So very powerful models using that. This all comes together in a cool dashboard. This is the end product of all that recruiting. There's about 40 different machine learning models behind this graphic, but this is what we show the coach. What are the schools you're going to go to? The competitive landscape, academic, and football ranks of the schools, how far you are from them. And then we, have, we forecast your UVA GPA. And we also forecast red or green, whether you're going to make it through your first year at UVA. We forecast your performance. We forecast your grit. It all comes together. If you're a hidden gem or a dud, that, that performance box, box there that's blue changes color. So all these models, all these dozens of models under here, which we did a pretty sophisticated machine learning models. The other model, we did some simple multinomial logistic regression models. All kinds of models behind this, but this is what the coach sees, and it's similar to what Natalie said. At the end of the day, this is what you're showing a coach. 
So to wrap up, I think um, something, a book I've been referencing for a long time, a book, Weapons of Math Destruction, I think it's great that she's the speaker tonight. I think this is a fundamental part. I've been working in data science. There's a lot of questions about the use of this data. Uh, what does it take to do good data science in sports? It's the goals and the stakeholders. The metric is and the goal are the hardest part. Data is often too much or too little. It's not exactly what you want. There's a considerable art to modeling in data science, but at the end of the day, to me, it's that, it's that creative use of these tools, which we did. It was really not, we did not advance the state of convolutional neural networks. We used them. We didn't advance random forest, but we used them. We used all those models. Client understanding is more important to me than model performance. And sports provides an excellent playground for us. And it really gets, I've been using it for 20 years in my classes. It really gets students excited, as I think, as Dean, as you found in your sports clubs, it really gets kids excited about sports. So STEM careers, too, I think it's kind of cool. We use sports to train students. One of my students right now is, it runs the Miami Dolphins, analytics for the Miami Dolphins. Another one of my students runs the analytics for the Marlins. The woman who runs the, the Dolphins analytics is 23 years old. She did her capstone with me two years ago and runs the whole draft strategy and all analytics for the Miami Dolphins. And so thank you very much. Went through it fast. Happy to talk in future. So thank you. We have time for some questions and answers um, as our uh, speakers come back. And Dean, do you want to join the speakers up on the stage? Um, we have our lovely colleagues with microphones. Please get their attention uh, if you'd like to ask a question and wait to ask your question until you are properly mic'd. So. so many questions. Do you all have questions for each other while we wait for the audience to stop being shy? Hello? Oh, okay, it's working. Hey, so my question, I'm just pulling it up, is for the third speaker. The social media predictive model was really interesting for seeing how a player might perform uh, or drop out of school in the future. Have we considered, or do you know of anybody that's considered using that for just the general student body to see if um, we can identify students in advance who might need help? Uh, with their academic career at the university or any other universities you might know of? I, I have not been involved in doing that. I, I probably people probably have. We did the way we did it was we we found that we found we selected the 100, 200 toughest players in the, in the last 15 years and used those as our kind of ideal point to map to as we did that. So I think you'd have to do the kind of same thing as what would be, you know, what's a healthy student that is successful or thrives in your university environment, then how would you find the attributes? We found those three of them that slide were the three we found were the most predictive ones of really success of being with what the coaches wanted is tough. But that was benchmarked into what they thought was a tough player. You'd have to create the same ideals if you were going to do that for a college and say, what does an ideal student look like? And there's a lot more diversity there. That might be harder to do. but. I think those were very predictive. We found them shockingly predictive. When you look at, we would look at case studies of students' social media, and it's shockingly predictive of what they're doing. We ran a lot of politicians through this. We ran university people through this. We ran the coaches through this. And uh, it was very, very insightful, I thought. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, what are some examples of social media posts that like correlate to toughness or correlate to the opposite? You know, we were able to use, we, we did not create it. I've done a lot of um, LDA models, text mining models and things like that. We did not create it. We used IBM Watson, but what they do is they create five dimensions broken into four more, so 20 dimensions of personality. And they've done this from hundreds of millions of postings that they've done the scoring for us into those 20 dimensions of personality. Um, but you would see the words we would look at to look at cases to understand ourselves. If you looked at the cases, you would act, if you looked at the individuals, we would pull an individual person and look at their tweets, and you would see the things that you, it's pretty shocking how some people are constantly whining and complaining. You could see it, you could, you could not going through the deep networks that they had built at, at, at IBM, 
but just by reading them, you could kind of see that people that are, that, you know, as you know, a lot of people have done text mining. There's all kinds of ways they score words and groups of words, and that's what the IBM Watson's doing. But, but when you looked at samples, you could see it. You could tell a person, this person's a complainer, they're a whiner, as opposed to people that were more leaders and positive and more promoting. You could see it. We actually, during the football games, too, because I spent four years, five years doing this, we would be sitting there. I had all the Twitter handles of the recruits that were in the stands with me. And I'd be reading their tweets why they were sitting there. And pretty interesting to see. So people, when you do the formal studies of, um, that you can do on grit and stuff like that, people are much more controlled and reserved. Um, as many people have seen in the last 10 years, Twitter seems to be an unfiltered use of words, which is a great source of, of really people's really more raw. So, so, that's, so I think you can see it, but it was buried in, in IBM Watson that had done hundreds of millions of samples of these. Okay, wait, could, could the average person access this model? Yes. Okay, and where did it again? The students did this, it's, it's for free online, you can do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for all your, your presentations, it was great. Um, this is a question for Dr. Bake on the geometric analysis. Um, do you, is it strictly with just um, geometries of movement, or how individualized can you actually get? Like, for example, I'm, I'm going to make this up, but like length of femur bone and BMI index, like, uh, can those things also be included as, um, as, as, uh, as design features in the predictive models that maybe affect the physics of what a 10 degree tweak might, might actually do to somebody? Yeah, absolutely. So, like, I, I guess a good example is uh, I'm a golfer. And then let's say I somehow master to reproduce the exact same joint angles of Tiger Woods. I'm not going to be Tiger Woods because I have a different body composition and different body geometry. So I think all of this data has to be normalized based off of the individual physical condition. So that's where I think, you know, this whole idea of like 3D, you know, body scans and, you know, all this geometric data analysis comes in because, you know, you cannot just tell everything from joint angles merely. You have to, you know, consider all this associative relationship between joint angles, joint velocity, uh, alongside all this, uh, you know, the body shape and their, their, you know, anthropometric, you know, compositions and things like that. So. Are there open source data sets that sort of capture those kinds of relationships? Um, yes and no. There are some generic purpose uh, open source data sets where you can, like, study people's body shape and things like that, but not thing that I'm aware of that is specific to sports. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I had a question around the January low temperature difference. Yes. yes. Um, did you find that like kind of correlated with like the distance between their home and the school, and like also that a lot of like southern schools tend to recruit better, or was it separate like a separate effect as well? The finalized models had a lot of interaction terms, so there are there are clearly interaction terms between the variables, so the, the, the mileage and the, and the weather and things like that. So there were interaction terms that crossed between things like the temperature. And we looked at a lot of different temperature things, you know, average temperature, highs, lows, things like this. The distance we actually uh, originally started with a binary thing: is it, it's a day trip or not? But then, what's a day trip? We have to define that break. And so, but yes, there were a lot of interaction terms in the model between those variables. We had about, I think it was up to 480 different variables went into the model. We, we narrowed it down to 21. I showed you four or five of the ones we picked, but we narrowed it down to 21, and there were interaction terms between those. At the end of the day, it was a, a multinomial logistic regression was our best model that gave us the most insight, as opposed to the ensemble model. I just thought it was a really cool insight. just wanted to ask one more about it. The dashboard, we were really proud of it. That was all done by undergraduate students. Everything, the slides were done by, everything was done by undergrad students, and it was the state of the art in the nation uh, recruiting dashboard. We do it now for golf. I've done it for golf teams now, and we've done it for football, so it's pretty cool. Stuff. Oh, um, I just, it's Steve, it sounds like your students are really cool. Just wanted to say that. Um, I had a question for the second and third speaker. Um, regard, regarding the athlete prediction, do you guys factor in the athlete's point of view. So say, I'm a, I'm a Washington football team fan, um, unfortunately, and I th it's like a common belief that any player that we get wouldn't perform well due to development. So say we had a five-star recruit who would do well here, but do 
better somewhere else. Um, do you guys factor, I guess, the athlete's point of view in that decision as well? Because although it might help our program, he probably would do better, let's say, at like Texas or something. I don't know. Yes, we try. Um, the hardest thing, I can, only, I can mostly speak to college basketball. That's mostly what I've looked at. We talk right now a lot about NIL, and sometimes doing better sport-wise does not always align with doing better monetarily now. And so having to, so a lot of athletes will do really well here at UVA from getting better in basketball, um, but they might have incentives to go to other universities based on NIL. So that's probably been the newest, biggest challenge that um, we haven't studied it, but I constantly hear about it. <laughs> and I'm so sure many of you do in media also. Um, so, and we've actually looked at things like their social media, not necessarily through sentiment analysis, but just in general what they are thinking and what they're tweeting after they go to certain recruiting visits, because student athletes will basically say anything on Twitter. Um, and that's been interesting, but we haven't done any analysis on that. But that's probably the lens on the forefront of a lot of college programs' minds right now. And same thing, we did the same thing. We track, we track the, uh, what, what schools they're following. So we know if you're a high school athlete, we know what schools you're following. We track that. We track from your social media what schools you're talking about. We also had an affinity score if you're mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle. Or a college, uh, how many of your fellow players went to that school. So we have all those variables built in. But with any data, sports data is so non-stationary. If you had a coaching change last year, even if it was just, a, just the offensive coordinator coaching change, we've seen that this year. With UVA, it changes things tremendously. And so that was a part of that unexplained variance is those things that it's really hard. So we had a style. We had a variable in there of the offensive style. We had, we had a, created a set of offensive styles of the high school team and offensive styles of the college team. And so those were variables in there. Getting as close to that as we could, but a lot of that is just really hard to, uh, and I think that's the missing variance that we're missing, is that really that, that what you're talking about. We tried as many surrogate variables as we could to capture that piece of it. Um, for Dr. Kupperman, um, I'm curious to what extent you integrate your background as an ATC into your research, if you do any kind of predictive injury analysis, any type of that stuff. Sorry, the echo was really bad. Could you say that on the microphone quick for oh, me? Oh, uh, your background as an ATC, if you integrate that into your research and any predictive injury analysis or anything like that. Yeah, my background as an athletic trainer has been very useful in getting me here. Um, it's how I got exposed to a lot of the sensor data that teams were using. Um, because a lot of this does filter down through the medical and sports performance staffs, which, which work very closely together. Um, and yes, when I, when I started um, my PhD, I was like, I'm gonna predict injury. That's kind of a fool's errand. Um, injury happens in sport. We can try our best to predict it, but injury will always happen. Uh, when you sit down with a coach, one of their first things when you ask them what they want to do with their data, often it's recruit better players, and I don't want any more injuries. Um, it's a temper, their expectations there. Um, but it also, and Steve and I have some great conversations about this in the, the video realm and how we analyze um, human movement patterns. If we don't take into perspective the motor development and how people develop patterns of motor behavior, um, which comes from the kinesiology lens or an athletic training lens, sports medicine lens, um, we're gonna miss large pieces of that puzzle. Um, I talked to a student last year um, around pitching data actually, and they were looking at aberrant pitching motions and they thought that that would cause injury. We know from anecdotal evidence from some of the pitchers who've pitched the longest in the MLB, that they actually change their pitching motions when they start to feel tweaks. So aberrant movement pattern does not always equate to, uh, or is not always predictive of injury, but can actually be a protective mechanism. And if you're not bringing in that lens, you might be missing a lot of things and honestly you don't always know what you're missing until somebody else is like, hey, I think I have an idea. Um, so it's really important to incorporate all of those diverse um, ideas and backgrounds when you're making these models, um, including athletic trainers. Always here for that plug. <laughs> Please join me in thanking the speakers one more time.